Professor S here. And for the next five minutes or so, I want to talk to you about the importance of protein conformation. Remember that word conformation for molecules means shape or structure. And also recall that proteins within cells have a very large list of possible functions. Well, that's possible because of the large number of possible conformations. I mean, remember, proteins are these enormous molecules that are elaborately folded over three levels of organization, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure, into unique conformations. And so within cells, the protein's conformation determines its function. And so anything that affects the conformation potentially affects the function. Uh, and remember, at those three levels of folding, the one force present at all three is hydrogen bonding. So any environmental variable that impacts hydrogen bond stability has a huge potential impact on protein. Consider temperature and pH, and consider this tertiary structure of beta hemoglobin. If I alter the temperature or pH around this protein enough, we begin to see the tertiary structure unfold, and then the secondary structure unfolds, and then we're left with an unfolded primary structure. We've completely unfolded or denatured the protein. The process of denaturation leads to cell death because cells count on proteins to do so many jobs. If the proteins unfold, they lose their functions and, and the cell can't survive. But we don't have to go to the extreme of denaturation to see the importance of protein conformation. Consider this polypeptide. I presented it back in my primary and secondary structure video. This isn't a random assortment of amino acids. It's actually the first seven amino acids of beta hemoglobin. And what I'm going to do now is take that sixth position glutamate. I'm going to replace it with a valine. I just substituted in a non-polar amino acid for an acidic one. It's the only change I'm making to the entire chain. Let's take a look at the consequences. Now, whether or not my substitution of valine at all directly impacts the secondary structure is completely immaterial. It's going to impact the tertiary structure because where once an amino acid could form ionic bonds or hydrogen bonds, it's now limited to engaging in hydrophobic exclusion. And it doesn't just impact a single location because the entire chain is going to have to contort somewhat to accommodate this new bonding arrangement and much of the tertiary structure will be changed. So you should recognize this as the cartoon I've used for normal hemoglobin. When we make this valine substitution, this is what happens to the tertiary structure. Now that's a pretty substantial change. And keep in mind, the actual functioning hemoglobin protein has two of these. Now it also has two alpha hemoglobins. Even if we don't change alpha hemoglobin, we're going to now impact the quaternary structure. And it's now going to look something like this. And we're not done, because this has consequences for the cell. Here I've collected a whole bunch of fully formed quaternary structure normal hemoglobins. In a human red blood cell, this is one of the most abundant solutes in the cell. It's the most abundant protein in the cell. So there's a lot of these, and they're just kind of globular proteins. If they were to bump into each other, they just should bounce off. They look like a whole bunch of them would fit in together nicely with no particular relationship. And that's critical because red blood cells are going to have this biconcave disc shape, and that shape is really critical to the red blood cell's function. But with the valine substitution, when I bring in those hemoglobins, you should notice a pattern. If two of these hemoglobins collided with each other in just the right way, uh, they could kind of link up in a way that normally hemoglobin wouldn't do. And we end up seeing these rods of hemoglobin begin forming. And we get these long rods of hemoglobin forming until the red blood cell is distorted and we end up with a cell looking like this. That's what sickle cell trait is. It's a single amino acid substitution that doesn't so much change hemoglobin's ability to do its job as it gives it a function it's not supposed to have. It allows it to form these rods that distort the cell's shape. A small change in the primary structure led to not only an elaborate change in the tertiary and quaternary structures of this protein, but it actually changed the cell's shape. And that's a big deal.
Professor S again. I realize this is the time in these videos where I normally make a bit of an idiot of myself in an effort to shamelessly self-promote. But for this particular video on protein confirmation, I actually have to add something. And so technically this lesson runs a bit over five minutes. But when we as professors and, and instructors and teachers teach about protein confirmation, we very often do exactly what I did in this video, which is to present the extremes and to show how bad it can be when protein confirmation changes inappropriately. The problem with that lesson, as accurate as it is, is it often leaves students thinking protein confirmation changes are bad. And that's actually not really true. In fact, really it's not true. For many proteins, they do their function by changing their conformation. Changing the conformation isn't just good, it's essential. And so to help you see that, I would encourage you to watch the next video, shameless self-promotion time now, on enzymes. Because in my enzyme video, I'm going to show you how a protein's conformational change can actually lead to its function taking place. So remember, conformational changes due to environmental shifts or mutation can absolutely be negative for cells, but conformational change in proteins is normal and good. Check out the other videos, like and subscribe, all that good stuff, and I will see you in enzymes.